Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the webinar. I'm Bruce Sells, uh, past president of the British Society of Soil Science, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our fourth webinar of the year. Before I welcome our presenters, I'd like to introduce the British Society of Soil Science um, as hosts of today's webinar, or a BS Cubed, as we're more uh, commonly known. We're an established international membership organisation and charity committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects. We bring together those working within academia uh, and also have a growing membership amongst practitioners implementing soil science in industry, as well as those with a keen interest in soils. We plan to host a, a total of 10 webinars during 2024, so, so do please keep an eye out on our website for, for further details of uh, future events. Um, and before we begin, just some basic housekeeping. Um, because there are so many of you here today, all your microphones have been muted. Uh, we will be taking questions after we've heard from both presenters, uh, and we'll be monitoring these uh, throughout the webinar. So if you could please uh, submit any questions you have by 12.50, if possible, uh, to allow us to get through as many uh, as we can before we close at one o'clock. Um, there is a raise your hand button, but we won't be using this uh, unless the presenters specifically ask for a show of hands. Uh, and today's presentation has also been awarded BASIS and NROSO CPD points. Uh, so if you're registered with either body, please contact us directly after the event. Um, and finally, please be aware that we are recording today's presentation. So uh, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Graham Armani. Graham has worked in the asbestos industry for over 20 years with roles including building surveyor for local authority, managing their asbestos issues. And for nearly 30 years, he's worked in the construction industry. His career started as a gas engineer uh, and then qualifying as a building surveyor before heading up the asbestos surveying and management department for a local authority in the 1990s. Since leaving the public sector, Graham has worked as an asbestos training consulting consultant, dealing with all aspects of asbestos training and assisting clients in all matters relating to asbestos, including contaminated land uh, and land remediation. Graham is the Managing Director of Asbestos Training Limited and is also the Chairman of UK ATA. So over to yourself, Graham. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you, Bruce, for this kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present um, this webinar. Um, I'll get started. So for many years in the UK, um, the asbestos industry has concentrated on, on identifying um, asbestos, obviously, in buildings. And that's been the case um, since the early 2000s and before. So all the guidance and instructions revolve around asbestos containing materials in buildings, protecting the most at risk the construction and maintenance workers. However, over recent years, it's become apparent that asbestos has been found within the ground, historical dumping, reuse during demolition many years ago. These sites are now going through a revamp and reuse and the legacy of asbestos um, seems to be rearing up again. So my webinar is to give you a brief, and I will keep it brief for everybody, understanding of how it can be found and what methods are used um, by this industry to identify asbestos. So this is what I'll be uh, covering today. Um, I am on quite a tight uh, time link, so um, I will be sort of speeding through it. Um, there's, there's quite a lot to talk about, but uh, obviously my time frame is, is limited today. So we'll have a look at the general sources of contamination, how it's occurred. We'll look at the types of contamination that we could come across. Um, whether that be product or whether that be free fibre contamination. Um, I just want to touch on training for geotechnical employees because I know in the past most of you have probably done asbestos awareness training. However, that uh, there are there are specific courses aimed at geotechnical um, staff. So we want to look, have a look at that. Um, and then of course uh, how it's found. So we'll have a look at this sort of guidance document HST 248 that was produced a few years ago, which we'll look at. Um, the two sort of aspects, uh, preliminary assessments and then the main survey, and then the results from that. So um, what, so, what type of results could you actually find? Uh, but again, very, very briefly, if I do get time, um, I've got a very brief case study that I was involved in a number of years ago, <coughs> which I'd, uh, I'd like to sort of share with you so that uh, it's not all bad news. Sometimes it can be, uh, it, you know, there's, there's ways around it that uh, can, uh, um, you know, deal with the asbestos in a safe and uh, cost-effective manner. 
So if we have a look at the contamination that we we, we could actually find in the ground, so um, ACM, uh, for those of you who don't know, asbestos containing material. Uh, most of the products that you can see on screen are normally going to be found in buildings. So very quickly, asbestos cement, um, corrugated roof sheets is probably the most common thing that everybody associates it with. Um, but it can be flue pipes, it can be a number, a number of other uh, building products. Asbestos insulation board or AIB as it's commonly known, um, that would be used for its fire protection properties um, found in domestic and commercial buildings. Insulation, boilers, pipework clarifiers, textiles for again for heat insulation and, and uh, uh, preventing the spread of fire. Uh, loose asbestos fibres, so we could come across in the ground sort of just raw asbestos fibres and then a mixture of uh, various, various different ACMs, excuse me. Um, but the thing to say about this is that all of those products um, generally, in most cases, uh, originated from internally within a building. So the question's got to be how do they find their way obviously into the ground? Now, there are a few exceptions to this where we can find uh, manufacturing plants that have manufactured such products. But if we have a look at um, some of the, the typical materials that we could come across, uh, the first one is asbestos cement. So on screen there in the middle, you can see part excavation. They've come across some product. Uh, we refer to this as product contamination. It's quite visible. It's quite easy to spot. It's quite easy to identify. And then most organisations will generally work on a reactive approach to uh, dealing with that. Um, asbestos cement, generally 10 to 15 percent asbestos. So uh, low content, lower risk <coughs> on the scale of um, the hierarchy of asbestos. Next one is as asbestos insulation, insulation board or insulating board, uh, AIB. In the middle there, you can see it's a bit more fibrous than the asbestos cement. So uh, has a higher potential to release fibres, has a higher percentage of asbestos as well. But again, probably found from off cuts or um, products that were found um, come out of a building as part of that construction project and as such um, found their way into the ground. High risk ACM generally worked on by uh, licensable asbestos uh, or licensed contractors, shall I say. Insulation, quite rare to find asbestos insulation, loose insulation, very high risk with a very high percentage of asbestos content, looks harmless, uh, looks a bit like fluffy sort of cotton to be fair, but uh, normally would have been found from a, a manufacturing plant who was using insulation or ma making insulation that has just found its way as, uh, into the ground and been dumped into the ground. This one's a random picture really. It sort of pretty much shows just all random types of asbestos containing materials and they range from the full hierarchy from the low risk products from such as resin based products uh, such as floor tiles, systems right through to high risk products such as asbestos insulating board, insulation and possibly even some of the worst kinds such as uh, coatings etc. Um, buried, uh, dumped, covered over, landscaped over, easy option really out of sight, out of mind, and it just sits there for many, many years, not causing anybody any problem until we start to agitate it. Um, this one, um, can you spot the asbestos here? So again, this is part way through excavation, so um, in right in the middle of the screen, you'll see a thin edge, probably about five to sort of eight millimeters in thickness. That is asbestos cement, obviously, where the bucket has um, come through and it's broken away the piece of asbestos. Some of it has obviously gone into the bucket, some remains there. And these are the sort of things that we need to spot, certainly when excavating and dealing with soils um, as part of construction or part of regeneration projects, etc. And lastly, is some old pipes, maybe asbestos cement or pitch fibre pipes, possibly installed many, many years ago. And then now come into uh, light during excavation or maybe they've come to the end of life. So as you've seen, the majority of what we find uh, product wise, uh, ACMs, we generally refer to this as product contamination, often visible and identifiable by undertaking a visual inspection. I can't show you the other type of contamination that you may come across as we can't see it. Um, this is known as free fiber contamination, can't be seen with, uh, can't be seen with a naked eye. So we need a microscope and laboratory analysis. Some of this is 
uh, leached out of asbestos products, some of it as um, naturally occurring, which Margaret will speak to you uh, about a little bit later. So how could it become contaminated? Well, there's various different ways. It's probably the most uh, the most common that I tend to find is probably from previous demolished buildings or structures that have had uh, uh, a regeneration 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago or beyond. But there are other routes, fly tipping, dumping, factory waste, uh, formal waste disposal sites. There's a site on, in the UK at the moment that they're actually testing the ground and they are boring through, uh, percussion boring through the ground, through an old um, waste disposal site, one of which is known to be an asbestos site. And of course, the levels coming up from that of the, the analysis are showing quite high readings uh, regarding asbestos. So there's many, many ways, obviously, the soil, how the soil has become contaminated. Um, so from a UCATA perspective, um, training for geotechnical employees where asbestos is known or likely to be disturbed, whether that be free fiber or product contamination, the control of asbestos regulations 2012 will apply. These regulations are quite complex and I don't have the time today to go through all of them. However, there are sort of three key regulations. Um, regulation 11, employer's responsibility to prevent exposure to employees. Regulation 16, which is employer's responsibility to prevent the spread of asbestos. And then this one, regulation 10. So if I just quickly touch on regulation 11. <coughs> regulation 11 uh, puts an onus on employers to prevent exposure to employees. So if we allowed employees to um, knowingly disturb asbestos or disturb asbestos and um, there is a, a release, there is an exposure, then that's a breach of regulation 11. If again, equally under regulation 16, if we knowingly uh, allow people to disturb asbestos, then of course there could be a spread of asbestos, other people could be affected by that. And of course, we all, well, pretty much we're all aware of the health effects and what the health effects could be from asbestos exposure. So regulation 10, however, uh, breaks this down into three categories for training. Most of you would probably have undertaken asbestos awareness training. A lot of sites won't let you on without a UCATA asbestos awareness training certificate. Um, there is also a non-licensed training, there's also licensed training. Um, over the years, I've found that um, a number of geotechnical employees have requested um, additional training to asbestos awareness where they are knowingly disturbing asbestos or likely to disturb asbestos. And of course, as such, a course was put together a number of years ago. This has now pretty much been agreed with UCATA. So it's an actual, it's a UCATA certificated course specific for geotechnical workers. What it does, it basically removes things like the, the vacuum cleaner that uh, a, a builder would use inside a, a domestic property or commercial property undertaking asbestos work. It removes certain sections that won't be required by geotechnical staff. Um, what it does cover on, uh, cover in particular uh, control methods for um, the prevention of the spread and prevention of exposure. It also covers things like decontamination. Some of you may be familiar with this, um, decontamination units on site, red zones, green zones, and then of course, RPE and PPE. And on the left there, you can see the certificate uh, provided by UCATA. So how do we find this? Um, so as a requirement under CAR 2012, asbestos needs to be identified and considered where it could be disturbed by sampling or groundworks. Should we call it a survey? Um, may not require an actual survey though. So you can see the aims of that uh, survey as it's stated there where it occurs, what forms, types of asbestos, and how frequently um, they occur. Now, the, um, the survey or assessment um, is broken down into two key elements. So the first thing we've got is the preliminary assessment, often referred to as the desktop exercise, uh, and the second, obviously, is the main survey. The desktop exercise does become quite an important part of the assessment. The desktop is to ascertain if there's a likely presence of asbestos on the site. This will look at the uses, the historical use of the site, what the site was used for previously. Uh, was it an industrial site? Did the business on site use asbestos? What did they do on the site? Did they manufacture products? Worst case, did they actually manufacture asbestos products on the site? And there are a few areas in the UK that did actually do this. A lot of these sites now are not accessible. Uh, due to the contamination levels um, and the viability of uh, cleaning that. 
planning records are a great source of historical um, information about the use of that site. Certainly with planning uh, records, you can start to see what uses the site was uh, uh, intended for. Um, what the intended use of that site is for. Is there a chance we could come across asbestos? Could it be left undisturbed? Could we just leave it? Um, modern day construction techniques now do require us to generally go into the soil, into the ground. So unfortunately might not be the case, but could we do um, change our construction techniques to make it um, less of a risk? What's the likelihood of disturbing asbestos on site? This is where the preliminary assessment comes into, into play. Um, in the sense that could, is, is there a chance that we could obviously come across asbestos? But if obviously there is a chance um, that asbestos could be found, then we could then move to a main site survey. If by the desktop study it looks like there's not likely to be asbestos, then we didn't, don't need to move any further. We could just work on a, a, re a reactive approach as we've done for many years that if somebody does excavate and they do come across asbestos, um, in any analysis or any visual inspection, then they can stop work and then refer that back. If, however, the preliminary assessment does identify asbestos, then of course, um, then we need to make, maybe think about a main site survey. Broken down into, again, three aspects. First would be a visual surface survey. Best way to describe this would be to walk the walk, as they say, look and see if there are any visible signs of product contamination, noting areas by mapping out the site. Uh, this may be sufficient based on the previous assessment, but normally additional surveying would take place. Secondly, this would then involve depth surveys to again look for visible product contamination. Um, depths can vary depending on the uh, excavation works. Uh, the spoil is laid out on the sheets and then the surface spoil is visually inspected. And then the final one is depth surveys for fine non-visible asbestos. So this is the free fibre contamination. Um, this would obviously, uh, for surface, would normally involve taking an area of a metre squared, 10 to 20 millimetres, shall we say, of a depth and retaining a one metre sample. For depth samples, uh, depending on the project um, that dictates that, um, but normally about 500 millimetres, so half a metre, collecting a one to two litre sample. Samples then cone and quartered. Uh, that's what cone and quartering looks like. I'm sure some of your members have, have done this probably more times than I have. So um, firstly, it's gathered, it's flattened, it's quartered until we get to the size that we need for the, uh, for the analysis. When taking samples, there are two, two general approaches to setting out sample locations. Sorry, I've gone too quick there. Um, these are known as probability, involving random selection, um, and then judgmental sampling. These locations would be based on the professional judgment of the surveyor and their knowledge to try to seek positive samples. There's a few examples there of simple random sampling, uh, stratified random sampling, and then systematic random sampling. And then you've got a couple of judgmentals um, to the bottom of the uh, bottom of the screen there. Generally, a minimum of two surface and two depth source samples should always be taken and increased proportionally to the area. Size of the grids uh, will be determined by the site. I was recently involved where we set the grids at 10 metres after the first round. These were produced um, to give a representative sample, uh, a rep representative result of the, uh, of the, of the site. Um, I'll fly through this one because I'm conscious of time. Uh, just a few pictures of tools that uh, generally surveyors or people taking samples would be required. Um, what happens to the samples? Very quickly, sent to a laboratory, they firstly undertake a visual look at the sample and see if they can find any product contamination. If no fibres observed, then they take it to the next level. They then take subsamples and then place it under microscopes and then hopefully will determine the gravimetric analysis of the actual samples that they've been given. Um, additional information, just to give you a, an understanding of um, the contamination levels in soil versus the exposure levels that we could find obviously in the air. Um, again, Margaret will mention some of this uh, on her talk and uh, once I'm finished. So when we consider asbestos in the soil and it is left alone and not agitated, there should not be any risk if it's, it's been there undisturbed for many, many years, why would it become a problem? However, when we start to move, excavate, agitate soil, fibres can become airborne. And in the UK, there are a number of levels of exposure that we have to consider. 
as this is not the root cause for asbestos related diseases sorry as it is the root cause this can be linked to the quantification of the uh, of the levels of contamination so in essence the higher the levels of asbestos in the soil as a percentage when agitated this will obviously increase the potential airborne fiber concentration this will then in turn increase the the risk of exposure which then in turn increases the risk of developing asbestos related diseases so it all comes down to understanding that level that we find in the ground and our starting point for buildings we've worked on this based on the percentage of asbestos in materials for soils we don't know that percentage so we have to ascertain that percentage uh, in 1989 sorry 1988 study by addison et al uh, one of the um uh, persons involved in this was professor uh, roger willie who i know very very well um concluded that uh, with a dry, a dry soil containing levels of a detection of 0.001%, fibres could still exceed the current clearance indicator. The question is, what is that current clearance indicator, which I will explain on the next slide. So in the UK, we have what's called a control limit, which is 0.1 fibres per centimetre cubed, and that is fibres in air. That's a concentration of asbestos fibres in air over a measured four hour period. There is a sporadic and low intensity exposure. We don't need to concern ourselves with that. The limit of quantification. So if you've ever had asbestos removed before an analyst um, will hand the area back to the contractor, the contractor hands, hands it back to the client, they have to meet what's called the limit of quantification or the clearance indicator, which is 0.01 fibers per centimeter cubed. For hazardous waste, 0.1% weight for weight content based on WM3. And then of course, um, considered contamination is between zero point, less than 0.1 um, and um, more than 0.001. So that would be contaminate, contaminated, but not hazardous. Whereas we wanna get it clean. We wanna get it to a point where it's non-hazardous and it's not gonna cause any risk. So we wanna get it down to a level of 0.001%. Um, considered trace, control of asbestos regulations don't apply. Neither does the um, hazardous waste regulations. Just to say, any product that is identified that contains asbestos will automatically be considered to be hazardous waste. Two guidance documents just to finish off. On the left, you've got Claire with the car soil document, which is an interpretation of the ACOP L143. Um, it's quite a good document, actually. And then on the right, you've got HSG 248, Appendix 7 within HSG 248, obviously relates to the um, uh, soils and surveying soils, etc. Uh, Bruce, I think I'm probably out of time, am I? Or have I got a couple of minutes just to finish this? You, sorry, Jimmy. Yeah, you've got a couple of minutes, Ben. Okay, fine. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at my time at the top, which uh, says I'm there. So very, very quickly, um, a site I was involved in a number of years ago, so the 1920 site, um, government case study, uh, mid-1980s, they demolished part of the site, which was Nissan Huts. Uh, they were demolished and leveled, so this had corrugated roof sheets pretty much um, covering the whole of the building. The site was uh, planned for redevelopment, so they had an inspection carried out, concluded it was 500 tons of soil contaminated with asbestos. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see some idea of cost. I appreciate these, these do vary from what they cost now, but this was a number of years ago. So overall, 42 loads required to be removed from site, £121,000. Is that really a cost-effective approach? So the solution we came up with was to train, suitably train uh, required people. Um, the soil went through a trommel as it went through a trommel and a conveyor system. They visually picked out the contaminated uh, pieces of what they saw was asbestos. Um, the soil was then tested afterwards. So gravimetric analysis was undertaken. The concluded level was less than 0.001%. And as such, the soil was proven to be clean, not contaminated, used on site as a backfill. The cement um, estimated about 60 tonnes that was disposed of as hazardous waste, which it has to be. Um, and therefore the disposal costs were about 14,000 pounds, saving of just under 100,000 pound disposal costs. Things obviously to consider in there was the time, cost of labour, uh, another a number of factors, which obviously would be added into that uh, cost variation. Okay, so that's me. Any questions? I know Bruce is going to be taking questions a little bit later. My contact details are there. 
So I think that's, uh, I'll hand yeah. back to you, Bruce. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. That was, that was really, really informative. Um, yeah, so as Graham said, just as a reminder, uh, we'll be taking um, questions for both speakers at the end of the session. So um, do please start adding your, your questions into um, the, the portal there as well. So um, our next speaker is Margaret Oliver. Margaret is a uh, BSU honorary member and Margaret's research interests have included the application of a wide range of numerical and geostatistical methods to soil and other data, including pollen counts, forestry, radon emissions, remotely sensed imagery, precision agriculture, and the instance of childhood cancer. Specific interests have been in sample design for spatial analysis and eventual mapping, risk analysis associated with prescribed thresholds in relation to soil pollutants or deficiencies of crop nutrients, and the relationship between different scales um, of spatial variation. And most recent research has been in the field of precision agriculture. Margaret retired at the end of September 2004 from her post as reader in spatial analysis at the University of Reading, but she's retained a link and a base at the university as a visiting professor since January 2005. Margaret has published over 100 reviewed, reviewed academic papers and has also made several contributions to books. So she's co-authored, uh, she's the co-author of three books and has edited two books. And since retirement has continued with her interest in the relationship between soil and human health. Margaret was uh, also the co-editor-in-chief of Precision Agriculture for six years until the end of 2010. She was deputy editor of the European Journal of Soil Science for four years and then editor-in-chief of that journal for four years. And from 2019 to 2023, she was editor-in-chief with Michael Goss uh, of the revision and updating of the Encyclopedia of Soils in the Environment. So over to you, Margaret. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Bruce, for inviting me um, today to talk about this. Um, I don't normally talk about the effects of toxic amounts of substances in soil. It's usually deficiencies and human health that I've uh, talked about more than um, toxic amounts. But I think one of the things I'd like to emphasize today, because the importance of soil on human health hasn't been recognized as much as it could have been and also um, with Graham talking about asbestos this a heading in the a newspaper about call to bury a toxic village uh, relates to asbestos so in the two villages in Cappadocia uh, one contains tremolite and the other arianite and both cause an endemic malignant pleuromesothelioma. You can see that the minerals appear quite different um, and it's possible for the doctors, well, the pathologists who looked at the lesions of these people to identify the village they came from because they were uh, different related to the uh, mineral that caused them. So that's the other bit of the paper. While I've got that on the screen, I'd like to mention that, that I think all soil scientists need to become more proactive in trying to get information into the press. And Raphael Viscara Rossell has just had a, an article published in the Canberra Times about his work on uh, emissions of carbon dioxide from rangelands. So please, soil scientists, become proactive. So the main research on trace elements began in the late 1920s and trace elements affect health through deficiency and toxicity in soil. They're most evident in isolated communities because the, the food is matched much more to the local environment. And it's much more difficult to identify these effect, effects in um, developed countries. M much is picked up from the effects on the vulnerable groups, such as pregnant women, children, and the elderly, into which I now sadly fall, but still working. And um, so the relations between trace elements and health are very complex. The soil condition affects them. Um, high pH can promote or restrict the availability of an element. 
or um, elements can enhance each other's toxic effects um, in synergism, or they can elements can act together and cause antagonism to another one, like copper and cadmium can affect zinc. Some forms of elements are much more available than others. Selenate has always been thought to be more available than selenite, but that's questionable at the moment. And irrigation leads to excess of certain elements, and this is a point that needs to be really taken seriously in terms of um, ir the, the increase in irrigation that's likely to occur. So some elements are essential both to us and to plants, but they can affect health um, when they're in excess accumulation. So I've got a list there of, of the ones that can cause concern, but there are also non-essential elements that can be toxic uh, at certain limits. And there's another list. So arsenic is a non-essential element and its sources can be natural or from industrial activity. Many of these um, toxic products have been applied in agricultural um, fertilizers and pesticides. Um, the pathways of the ingestion of soil particles themselves had also contaminated water. And you can see some of the uh, sad effects that occur as a result of the contamination. Bangladesh, I'm sure a lot of you know, has a major problem with arsenic contamination. Um, it occurs naturally in the groundwater related to arsenic compounds in the, in the soil. And the delta area, when it becomes waterlogged, the arsenic becomes mobile, and this results in the contamination. So excess cadmium, there was a lot of information about this uh, many years ago at Shipham, where a field was contaminated from fertilizers with cadmium. The problem is it remains in the soil for a very long time. It's more available at lower pH, and it accumulates in cereals and animal offal. But the problem with this is it causes serious renal dysfunction. This example in uh, Japan um, of itai itai disease, um, I learned recently that it's called ouch, it, it, it translated as ouch ouch disease. Um, a lead zinc mine was polluted, polluted a river in um, Italy and all in Japan and also paddy soil. And there was 10 times as much cadmium in the rice as in the uncontaminated soil caused serious kidney damage. And you can see on the left-hand side, the area where the contamination was worse from the pollutants. And then on the right-hand map, you can see uh, the area where the, there was high um, incidence of itai itai disease. And you can see in these um, photographs here, the middle kidney is very necrosed and the right-hand one as well is withered. And then there are lesions in the bones as well that have occurred as a result of this disease. Um, I think we all know in soil science the, the problems with lead. There's been many, many studies of the uh, pathways of ingestion with children, the hand-to-mouth um, ingestion by children. It's especially toxic to children because it accumulates in the body and it can cause neurological um, de defects and reduces children's IQ. Hence, um, the seriousness with which this was taken in the UK and Europe as well. I'm sure many of you think, well, many of these things have been dealt with in Europe and the UK now, but these problems with these metals and, um, are still going on in the developing world. Um, mercury is a non-essential element. We've known, heard a lot about that in the past, can accumulate in the soil. And again, many of these elements cause kidney damage, also heart damage and um, issues with the nervous system. 
chromium and copper. So chromium is important for um, to avoid diabetes. It can be natural or um, uh, anthropogenic. Um, in excess, it again causes cardiovascular disease. It can be carcinogenic. So several issues if there's toxicity. Copper toxicity is rare, and uh, but it still can cause issues with children. Fluorine is something that relates very strongly to um, the semi-arid regions and areas with high rates of irrigation. Um, it's an element that's rapidly absorbed by the body and it enters the bone structure permanently. Um, we all know that fluorine has been added or fluoride in, in the case of adding it to water has been added to water in Britain to avoid dental caries because deficiency can lead to that. But excess leads to fluorosis and you'll see the list of uh, countries where this is serious. Um, it also causes softening of the bones and you'll see here the effect on uh, teeth where there's too much fluorine present and on the left hand side the person who's got the softening of the bones genubalgum and then the large areas suffer from fluorine um, problems. Nickel occurs naturally but also associated with um, applications of sewage sludge and many of these elements, trace elements, are present in sewage sludge but again uh, we are constantly getting better at dealing with this in this country. Um, it's mobile especially at low pH it's important for human metabolism, but again leads to problems with the livers and kidney and neurological effects and other things. Uh, selenium, usually I'm talking about selenium because it's deficient. And in Britain, we, we do suffer from some selenium deficiency. The importance of selenium in the diet wasn't recognized until the 1960s. Um, it's got a narrow range between deficiency and toxicity. And selenosis is the illness that results from toxicity. Interestingly, it was first identified in animals in arid and semi-arid regions as early as the middle of the 16th century, although they didn't know what the problem was, but they saw all the issues that resulted from the animals having too much selenium in their diet. And you can see here these sheep affected by um, too much selenium in their, in their um, diets. Oh, one of those has gone. I've lost one of the slides showing the effect on humans. It causes effects on, in, on human nails and also um, loss of hair in humans. Um, zinc is an element that is, has become increasingly of concern over the world. It's deficient over very large areas and its, it's um, effects are rather insidious. So again, it was not recognized until the 1960s. Um, it results, toxicity results where there's mining and smelting very often or it can be natural. Again, sewage sludge, fertilizers, pesticides are the main causes of this toxicity and giving rise to various tissue lesions, anemia and excess headaches. Oh, there's, I don't know how that got out of place. I was trying to remove a slide earlier, that's what happened. So this is the effect of the toxicity. Sorry about that, everybody. So to conclude then, it's been much research is being done in soil and human health, but there remains a lot to be done. It's very difficult research to do. Um, the, co the relations are much more complex and subtle than was originally thought. We need to gain understanding of the causes of element toxicity and, and uh, deficiency in the environment. 
And if we can do this, then we can provide more information to the epidemiologists and pathologists who are looking to improve human health. There's a lot of advance being made in reducing the toxic anthropogenic inputs into soil um, and in the remediation of polluted sites. But as I, going back to what I said earlier, um, this applies in, in Europe and the United States, but in many of the developing countries, um, this, there is still, there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. And I think the future is bright because with improvements in databases and methods of mapping the risk of toxicity and diseases, this will help to further our understanding. And also, we need to engage a lot more in um, the medical sciences. I've said this before because they, um, we all work in our isolated areas, and it isn't until we get more crossover between these um, disciplines that we're going to make progress in this area. So I'll leave you with um, this. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Margaret. Again, another another fantastic uh, presentation running through huge amounts of, of information there as well. Um, so we've now come to the uh, the sort of the, the Q and A uh, session of the of the webinar. Um, and so um, if you can please um, keep putting your questions into uh, the portal, um, that'd be really good, and we'll try to get through them. Um, yeah, th those are two fantastic um, presentations, and I think also perhaps quite sobering, just to to have that that recognition of the risk that is is out there um, from both historical and and sort of current um, activities. And it's a uh, what came to my mind was perhaps as a sort of a, a slight dilemma there for us as soil scientists, and particularly maybe for for us as the the British Scientific Soil Scientist, that we want we want to uh, to grow. Uh, soil science as a career. We want more people to become soil scientists. We want to engage with the public. Um, mm -hmm. And part of that engagement, in, in my mind, is about looking at soils, feeling soils, smelling soils as well. Um, and clearly, we've got to be very, very conscious of the, um, the health and safety risk, both to our, ourselves as, as soil scientists and when we're out surveying, but also in that engagement piece um, in, in, in how we how, how we um, how we address that um, as well, um, but yeah, two two fantastic presentations. Um, if I just go to the the questions, uh, and apologies that my my screen is not showing, I think all the information. But I think the first first question, um, and I hope I pronounced this right, from uh, Ntuli, um, is a question for yourself, Graham. Are there any companies that you're aware of, or organisations um, that work with UK ATA uh, in South Africa. A very specific question there. It's here. Yeah. Um, I I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I do know that the chief operating officer Craig Evans, he has connections, or UCATA have connections throughout the world. Um, not. I, I don't know if it's specific to South Africa, but <clears throat> maybe if your member was to uh, email UCATA then uh, Craig would certainly be able to answer that question. But as, a, as an organisation, although it's the UK Asbestos Training Association, <clears throat> we are spreading the, world, the word overseas and we have uh, quite a few countries around the world that are um, sort of trying to follow our lead with the, the standards that, uh, that we have set. So, yeah, if, you're, if your member can send an email to Craig, then I'm sure he'll be able to answer that. Um, and, and apologies, I can't see all the names of who's asking questions, but um, the next one relates to probably a question for, for both of you. Um, uh, someone's recalling that large parts of Glasgow having um, excess levels of, of, of chromium-6 causing health problems um, across large parts of the city, uh, including for those playing sports on contaminated ground. Um, so are there any other areas of the UK which are particular hotspots uh, and suggestion perhaps Cornwall or the Southern Uplands perhaps? Do you want to go, Margaret? Well, I do. Uh, with chromium, 
no i don't i don't know of any other i don't know of any particular areas sorry uh with asbestos um quite a few um, sorry margaret um did you say chromium the the, the the example um was erasing to uh, a recollection about glasgow and chromium but i think the question could be around hotspots oh, for any other yeah sorry go on, graham you finish uh, there are a number of hotspots in the UK. Um, Glasgow is um, historically, from its shipbuilding industry, uh, not necessarily contaminating the soils, but historically from the use of asbestos. Um, if we was to go down to, let's say, down to East London, um, there was an old Cape asbestos factory. Cape, obviously, a big asbestos <laughs> manufacturer, and the 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 the, the ground has been uh, rebuilt over. Um, with the town centre and housing, um, and there are a few there are a few areas around there where there are a few hotspots. Um, there is a, an area, I believe it's I believe it's up in um, Rochdale, but don't quote me if I'm, I'm wrong there. Um, there was a, a Turner's um, factory. It's on, I believe it's on a big roundabout. I've never seen it. It's on a big roundabout, and um, the factory itself is so the land is so contaminated. It's just not cost effective to clean the soil um, to then reproduce maybe domestic properties, uh, housing um, developments, etc. And there are a few areas like that where manufacturers in the UK. <clears throat> the thing that the, the history behind the UK was that we, we, we we've led quite a lot in respect to um, development and standards and quite high standards. And of course, manufacturing and asbestos was uh, was a big, big industry for, for 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 many areas within the UK. The legacy from that is the contaminated soil, the contaminated land that obviously that, that's been left behind. The businesses have now gone because uh, there's no there's no business there for them anymore. Um, and over time, I'm sure it will it will come to um, close that they will clear this uh, clear these areas and make sure they're obviously they're clean and. Uh, they're not contaminated, but I have been involved in areas. I'm not going to say specifically, but I spoke earlier about 0.001% um, content uh, for gravimetric analysis. I've been involved in areas where they've sampled 200 millimeters down and they've found 0.5%, which is greater than the hazardous waste um, threshold at 200 millimeters down. So we are talking, I don't know, convert that eight inches down that they've found levels of contamination. So um, it's there, there's many, many hotspots obviously throughout the UK. I think that's true with lead as well. Um, mm. Some of the studies that have been done with lead. And I mean, the problem is we don't know a lot because we haven't mapped areas in sufficient detail to know where all these uh, contaminants or potential pollutants are. But say, for instance, one of the studies that I um, looked at was a lead study in uh, Yorkshire. Um, they did a, um, a detailed survey there because of, it was going to be a children's playground. But that doesn't happen very often. So yeah. how many, you know, we don't know how often children might be affected by things like that. And going back to you mentioned Cornwall, radon, of course, is an issue there. I left my radon slides out, so because um, I didn't think I'd have time. Brilliant. Thank you. And and that leads very nicely on to to a, a next question. Uh, and I kind of was really interested in you, you, your comment, Margaret, that the future's bright and about you know, data, essentially availability of information. But there's a question here about how can individuals protect themselves and their families from the potential health risks associated with contaminated soils, particularly if they live in or near affected areas? Uh, maybe a, a view from both of you would be interesting. Mm. Well, I think one of the things is to, to if you live in, uh, working in the soil, um, I do think that people need to, they need to be much more careful about their hand-to-mouth contact because I think they can be absorbing materials um, that they're not aware of. They think it's okay to take in some soil, but there's lots of nasties in the soil that people need to be aware of. I mean, a lot of the microbiology, for instance, they need to take care of. 
And also inhalation is a problem. I mean, I don't know whether you saw the article about in the southwest of uh, California, um, valley fever is increasing. And this is from the inhalation of a fungus. So. Uh, from, from my perspective, um, it's it's got to come back down to this sort of preliminary assessment that's undertaken before we start to redevelop these brownfield sites, looking at the news this morning, there's lots of political talk about, you know, 1.5 million new homes come in and brownfield grey sites, et cetera. Um, it, it's the, from the workers' perspective, um, for many, many years, we've found that we, as an industry, have worked reactively to finding contaminants such as asbestos. Uh, we need to be a little bit more proactive in that approach. and with guidance documents that we showed earlier, HSG 248, that's a, that's a step forward. Uh, we spoke earlier off camera, Margaret, about knowledge and about sharing information. Um, and it, it's all got to come back down to that. It's, let's be honest with what's, what, what we've got here. Uh, let's not try to hide it under the ground. Let's, uh, let's speak freely and um, make sure we've managed the, managed the issues and manage the risk accordingly. Uh, I mean, going back to the, you know, the future is bright, the more we are going to be able to get much more information. I mean, the, it's possible that we can get much cheaper information about what's in the soil eventually with probes. I mean, the, uh, someone was talking at the Seoul meeting last year about the probes that can be used um, in the soil. And also, they've got human um, monitoring and this is how we're going to and this, this produces masses of information and that's how we are going to develop and improve our environment enormously and where soil scientists are going to be at the center of things which is where we should be yeah i i, I agree i think as the comments you've made about you know data sharing particularly going a bit point about people being open and honest about what's there so rather than trying to hide it as a as a problem um i think will be uh be really important alongside then you know basic hygiene i suppose it comes down to in terms of you know that point you made margaret about uh, you know hand to mouth um uh, uh transfer and just washing your hands as, as source scientists but also partners um you know when we're out and about when we slip and fall over and get muddy. <laughs> um, yeah. Just those, those basic sort of things. Um, and and that, that point around collaboration is, is, is next one, not really a, a, a question, but it's kind of a, perhaps a, a point of note. Um, someone sort of said a, a great comment about the requirement for communication between and across disciplines that you made, Margaret, in your presentation. And this person is recommending that interested people look at the Society for Environmental Geochemistry and Health uh, and they put in there, that's segh.net for more information along those lines. Um, so, yeah, so a, a, probably a, a good link. And, and as ever, you know, soils, are, you know, are at the heart of so many things um, in, in our environment, in our in our life, in our world. Um, and making sure we've got those linkages um, is really, really important. Um, so there's another question here, or questions to be for yourself, Margaret, about what do you think about uh, total organic fluorine as a test in line with PFAS analysis? I think that's something you, you're aware of. I, 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 haven't, I, have, I, haven't, I haven't got anything to comment about that. I, um, it's, I don't know anything about that. I have done some work on organic pollutants, um, for a paper that I've just written, but I couldn't comment on that particular. Okay, uh, a very specific one. I, 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 again, um, I, or can I see a name? Is that Martin Webster? I mean, I've got I've got colleagues who work with PFAS. Um, if you wanted to, uh, if there's something you wanted to follow up on there, I'm, I'm happy to sort of link you through to uh, someone I work with on that. Um, so the next question then is. Um, uh, how does soil contamination affect agricultural practices and food safety? Uh, and what measures are in place to ensure the safety of crops grown in contaminated areas? I don't know whether either of you would like to uh, have a go at that one. I think that's, that's, that's a, uh, that is a thousand dollar question. <laughs> um, obviously farmers 
will be aware of certain contaminants because of the way it affects the crops. And um, this is, I come stand in part to irrigation. Greater care needs to be taken with irrigation because a lot of um, materials, a lot of elements, uh, concentrate in the soil as a result of irrigation. Um, farmers are aware of what their, their soil contains largely. And, um, and I do think we have to be very, very careful about the, the contaminants going into soil. I mean, one of the things I haven't talked about today is for, um, pharmaceuticals. And some of the pharmaceuticals now that they think that have been applied in sewage that are being taken up into crops. And so there's so much that we need to take into consideration. Um, so yes, they are moving from, and it's like the um, um, microplastic. Um, this yeah. is moving. This is moving from the soil into the crop. It's another pollutant that we've got to deal with. Yeah, I think we very in in that to sort of answer that question we very quickly. Come back to that need for collaboration, interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. cross discipline working, recognizing the soils uh, and, and the natural environment is a system that is interlinked. And you 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 tweak one part, um, and something will change elsewhere, or there are implications elsewhere. Um, just check on the time. Uh, I've got time for a couple more questions. Um, one specifically for yourself, Graham. Can you clarify the rules retrace versus the 0.001% HSC248, um, which specifies trace as being one or two fibres or fibre bundles in the whole sample, um, which can be orders of magnitude below that percentage threshold? Sorry, just um, repeat the question. The the rule regarding it's, trace. It's clarifying the rules between the the trace um, versus that that sort of percentage in HSG two four one. I think the question is really about looking at how does that match with one or two fibres or fibre bundles, which may be orders of magnitude below that threshold of zero point zero zero one. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the, the thing with the, the the definition of trace. As laid down in the regulations, um, they they they've got to come to a conclusion that um, where where the levels are such low, such as one or two fibres, then of course the regulations won't apply because the risk obviously is very very low in that in that respect. Um, with regard to the 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 quantification of the contamination in the soil of 0.001. Um, it's all relative to the, the size of the sample, obviously, that they analyse. Normally about 30, um, 30 grams or so, uh, and then they'll, they'll work out that percentage. But with, with, the, with the regulations, um, if, if we were to take a line that um, everything that contained asbestos, whether it be one or one or two fibres, then the, you know, the, the control measures would have to, have to apply. Um, we, we, we wouldn't leave our homes. Um, we have to we have to have a line there. So the HSC have come out and defined trace as the, as the, as the one or two fibres, but it depends on the, obviously the analysis that uh, determines that. The chances of coming across two fibres as a bundle is probably going to be slim. It's either going to be nothing or it's going to be many many fibres. To be fair. Brilliant. All right, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, there are other questions in uh, that have been logged in the portal. Maybe we'll um, we'll try and pick those up offline. Um, but yeah, thank you to, to participants for all the questions that you've uh, you've put in there. Um, and it'd be great to have more time at some point to go through those. Um, so yeah, just for me to close now, really. So on, on behalf of British Society of Soil Science, I would like to express our thanks to, to Graham uh, and to Margaret for coming along to present today. Uh, thank you to all you for attending. Um, you will find a quick feedback survey when you leave the webinar, uh, which we really hope you'll take time to complete because it's really useful for us to understand how, how well these, these webinars are, are landing. Um, and also the recording of the webinar, if you want to look back or if, if you haven't been able to join today, will also be available after the event on our, our YouTube channel. Um, our next webinar is scheduled to be on Wednesday the 8th of May on carbon sequestration. So do please keep an eye out on our website um, and in a, a follow-up email for, for details of how to register for that. 
Um, and yeah, I, I hope to see you all at, at future events. In the meantime, thank you again and goodbye.